wanted to start off our discussion of faith with trying to understand the myth. Can faith be passive? And you know, we're today we're looking at some different ideas such as you know, is faith and belief interchangeable? And in my opinion, it's not. And the reason why I say that is I can believe in stuff all I want, but that doesn't necessarily mean I act on it. Faith, for the moment, the same dialogue as if God wants it to happen, it happens. Why is that important? Well, is faith, belief, and actions, or is it belief in ourselves? Not necessarily. I think it's a conclusion that you can't reach for this discussion, but I don't feel it should be the final conclusion either. The reality is, I think that God is working side of the equation, our belief, our actions, how we react, that's faith. That's our side of it. If we don't participate, it's not going to work. So, what I would like to say is, choose faith. Choose action. As Trevor was saying, not just believing that God exists, and it's not just doing what's right in line with God. Because someone can do the right thing and not be a Christian. So it's, it's a little bit more than both of those things. You see, if you take the fact that God exists, and you know the fact that God exists, and that Jesus died for us, and that he's our Savior, faith is the thing that will bring us into action. That faith of us knowing that what is true will force us to change. It's not just the knowledge of God, it's the action and the knowledge. I got a little example. I'm, I'm a college student, and I'm taking a health class this semester. So I learned all about nutrition, everything that I could possibly want to know about nutrition. <laughs> I can pass a test on nutrition. I'll know exactly what you should eat, what you can't eat, the triangle thing that they test you on, all that stuff. Now, whether I take that into my life is a different story. Sometimes when I'm out, I have an option between health food or fast food. Sometimes I get fast food because it's so dang cheap. <laughs> I mean, it's just so convenient. It would be like if you walked faith and, and belief. It would be like if you, you were going to a doctor's office and you saw the doctor smoking outside in the parking lot. It's just, what would you think about? So James, James reminds us in the book of James that mere believing puts us on the same level as doing. James 2, 17 through 20 reads, So you see, faith itself is not enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you do not have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that God is, or there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Demons know better than anyone that God exists. That doesn't mean that they're in the right. <laughs> they, they know that he created. They know about Jesus. They just don't, they don't know him. They don't know his heart, they don't have a relationship, they don't have faith. They believe in him, but they're not with him. 
A lot of Christians today define faith by belief. They say, oh, I'm a Christian because I believe in God, but they don't show that in their actions, which is what's really important. I'm not saying that works aren't important. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying that if we have faith that God is the creator of the universe and Jesus is our savior, we're not just going to sit around. And sometimes we do. We need to be like the good Samaritan who let his beliefs affect his life and his actions and didn't just walk by. We need to not worry because we have God, the creator, on our, on our team. I mean, that's the best coach ever. How can you argue with that? And not be afraid because what's bigger than him? Nothing. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. I know we read it. I'm going to read it. <laughs> now, faith is confidence in what hope for assurances about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commanded for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that we, how so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. Love it. So now we know what faith is and how important it is, but how do we live it? How can we live lives that are pleasing to God? How do we live by faith? In order to answer this question, let's take a look at the Bible's examples of people who lived by faith. If you have your Bibles with you, please open up to Hebrews 11. And if you don't have your Bibles with you, there are Bibles in the chairs in front of you. God would send someone from Eve's offspring to take vengeance on the one who brought the temptations of evil into this world. Although at that time Abel didn't know his name, this seed that Abel hoped in was Jesus, the one who would be stricken in the field while crushing the head of the serpent. Trusting that God would make right what was wrong in the world, Abel gratefully gave up the best of his blessings, even though he didn't receive that promise in his mortal lifetime. This is the faith that we can have also, because we also can trust in the promise of God destroying Satan. Let's move on to verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. 
So it's my faith. He left this earth before he died. Enoch's faith came because he trusted in the coming judgment of the world. How did Enoch know about God's coming judgment? Well, the book of Jude records Enoch prophesying in verses 14 and 15. And here's the prophecy. Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the hard things which the ungodly age has spoken against them. So Enoch's faith was even evident in his son, in his son Methuselah, whose prophetic name, according to the exhaustive dictionary of Bible names, means his death shall bring judgment. Methuselah died the same year as the great worldwide flood. And now we have Noah in verse 7. By faith, Noah warned by God concerning events yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for saving his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So Noah, just like his great-grandfather Enoch, had his faith because he trusted in the coming judgment on the earth. We also can have this faith. We know the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Do you believe that? Do you know that all of your money, all of your possessions, all of your achievements that haven't been made by faith will be destroyed by God? Cling to Him and not to what won't last. When you understand that, then you can share in the faith of Noah and Enoch. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was uh, that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in a land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city that has foundations, and whose designer and builder is God. Abraham gave up his home in the land of Ur because he trusted in the home that God would give him, that it would be better than the home he already had. We can have the same faith. God's promise for heaven is for us too. We just need to trust that heaven is greater than what can be found on earth. We need to be willing to forsake what we have now for what God promises us. Can you do that? Can you trust that God knows better than you do? I'm not saying that we all need to give up all that we have. But ask yourself, if God asked you to give up your favorite thing, would you be willing? Do you really trust that God has your best interest in mind? These are some good reminders in Proverbs. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. Proverbs 28, 25, and 26. An arrogant man stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord will prosper. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. Knowing these things, Satan will try to convince us that we know better than God. And he will try to tell us that if we don't make our own way, things will turn out poorly for us. But Romans 8.28 says, And if we know, and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This is tough to believe sometimes. When you lose your job, when you lose a loved one, when any terrible thing happens to you, when you see wars, natural disasters, corrupt governments, the poor starving, the sick dying, the righteous being condemned, and the wicked being set free, do you believe that God 
God causes all of those things to work for your good? I don't understand the ways of God. But if the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than my ways. And so trust that Jesus, who is the Lord of all, always does what is right. This is the faith that pleases God. Hebrews 11, 6 reads, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Uh, you probably got a handout if there's not, if you didn't, there's one in the foyer that uh, looks like this. Um, it lists all of the people in Hebrews 11 who had actions of faith and uh, what they gave up in that faith and why they did it. So we can look at that reason they did it and we can share those reasons. Hebrews 11 13 through 15 summarizes this. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland, as they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. That is why they were faithful, and that is why we too can be faithful. Because we will. I mean, we're going to meet other people who have faith in Jesus, but it looks different from us. I mean, who, who's right? Do we go scorched earth? Jesus uh, flipped tables in the temple. Maybe we should, should we do that, you know? And uh, I, I'm thinking not. But um, Romans chapter 14 is, I think, one of the perfect answers to these kinds of questions. And that's what I'm going to be uh, reading from today. Um, it just talks a lot about this because... You know, we need, we need a response when we run into these people. And uh, beginning here in verse 1, right off the bat, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. And that was weird when I read that for the first time. What do you mean disputable matters? You know, I, I kind of was one of those people that wanted the Bible to give me a list of what to do, that I could just kind of walk around through life like this. Have all the instructions given to me but here he's saying you know there are some things that are disputable some issues in life where you could say is this right or wrong and paul would say well it depends it depends what do you mean it depends and uh he goes on here one man's faith allows him to eat everything but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables 
the man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. What an interesting little, little beginning here, where he just says, these two people believe different things, but they both should act in accordance with their own faith, even if it's different, and not condemn the other person for doing it differently. That, that, was, that was very challenging for me when I read that for the first time, but I think it's in keeping with the love that God teaches. If we're really saved by grace through faith, then we're not saved by the things we do. We're saved by the love we show to God and to each other. We're saved by acting on whatever we do know. And he, he keeps going on with this. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. That's the sincerity. And he's going to talk about this more later, but God knows our hearts. Okay, so each man should be fully convinced in his own mind. Uh, he who regards one day as special does so to the Lord, not to himself. This isn't a selfish thing. All right, and he, yeah. Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For no, none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give account of himself to God. Um, this, is, this is really significant because it's reminding us no one gets away with anything. Some, one of the things that bothers us when we run to someone whose faith is maybe they watch you know, shows that have language or, or you know, scenes that we think Christians would not. You know, we, we, and, we're, and we're legitimately concerned about that, but... He's saying here, everyone has to give an account to God. If people say, well, I'm fully convinced and, you know, that uh, you know, I, I need to eat 20 donuts every day. God really wants me to do that. You know, we can, you know, you're, you're thinking in your mind, okay, I, that's probably, but, but it's not our job to call them on that. That's between them and God, and God's not going to be fooled, okay? He, he, he's not going to be deceived. Everyone's going to have to stand before God, and God's going to say, really? You said I said that? And they're going to be like, well, um, I guess you didn't, right? So... <laughs> So, and, and so that's not our job. He's the judge. He's the father. We can speak to each other in love about these things, but we leave judgment to God. He's the one that knows our hearts, and we don't. Okay, it's, that's not our purpose. Therefore, stop. let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. All right, think about that. You know, you're, you're going to eat bacon in front of someone and you know, cause them all for, for food. Aren't they more important than food? I love that. For whom Christ died. Do we think about that when we argue with people? When we talk about this, do we think to ourselves, Jesus died for this brother, for this sister, and let that spirit influence the way we talk about these things? Because we need to talk about them, but do we try to be right or do we try to be loving? Uh, do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace, to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Again, just very, very clear there. And you could fill that, fill in that blank with anything else. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of detail, for the sake of some specific thing, some disputable matter that, that someone's doing differently than you do. All food is clean, but it is wrong for men to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, disputable matters, keep between yourself and God. Again, I, I read this for the first time and was surprised. I, you know, most of the time we're reading 
about preaching the gospel boldly and telling people about Jesus and proclaiming the faith even against opposition. And here he's saying, yeah, whatever you believe about this stuff, keep it to yourself. Keep between you and God. It might seem a little strange at first, but it makes sense from the perspective of loving God and loving your neighbor. And he especially talks about, he talked about earlier, if, if you really have the superior knowledge, from a Christian perspective, act like it. Be gentle, be kind with your brother or sister. Be patient with them as God is patient with us. He's patient with us with our sin, okay, with the evil stuff we do, let alone the disputable matters. So whatever you believe about these things, keep it between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. And there's the hard part right at the end there, right at the end of the chapter, because, I mean, that's hard. I, I still, to this day, I wake up in the morning and I, I begin thinking about me. I don't begin thinking about Jesus. I have to come back to that later. I have to go late. Wait, 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 wait. Because Jesus, I need to be moving. Because Jesus, I need to be living how I live. Everything that doesn't come from faith in him is sin. You're putting your faith in something else, be it yourself or, or, or whatever. And that's a dangerous place to be. And again, I mean, this, this doesn't mean that we aren't going to talk about these kinds of things. They're going to come up even as a, a practical matter. You know, we have worship together. We we're, we're, we're want to meet other churches. We want to meet people from other, other places. But we need to do it with the right attitude of love and remember that it, we're saved. If we're saved by grace through faith, if we really believe that, we're not saved by anything else. We're not saved by perfect doctrine or by uh, the details of our lives. I have a feeling when we get to heaven, no matter what you know, church we're from, there's a lot of things we're going to realize. I think we're going to get just gain new knowledge when we get there. And there's a lot of things we're going to go, oh, we weren't really doing that exactly correct. And you know what? Our Father who loves us and sent his Son to die for us isn't going to care. That's not the important part. The important part is we reached out to him with everything we had and we knew and we lived in faith. And that's what's going to save us. Jesus emphasized that over and over again in his ministry. I uh, kept saying, your faith has saved you when Jesus was the one saving them. He's, he's pointing out, I save the people who have faith in me, not the people who know exactly what's going on. And with that, that will conclude our uh, message for today. Um, you have any needs, uh, please come forward as we stand and sing here. <laughs>